welcome to the 700 Club. What would you do if rockets were raining down on your cities? That's the big question for me Israeli Ambassador Ron Dermer has for America. Why does he say the media is on the terrorist side? And how can Americans help the Jewish state? Our Chris Mitchell reports on the ground in Jerusalem. In one week, Hamas and other terror groups have fired more than 3,000 rockets into Israel, putting up to 4 million Israelis in bomb shelters day or night. Ambassador Ron Dermer wonders how Americans would respond. I would ask Americans who are watching this unfold in Israel, think about this. Our army is fighting this war and surgically going after the terrorists, not thousands of miles away from our shores. It's right in our backyard when our own population is in bomb shelters. So imagine 150, 200 million Americans sitting in bomb shelters. What do you think they'd want their army to do in order to get at the terrorists who are firing rockets at them? Many of Hamas's rockets have hit towns in south and central Israel, including its second largest city, Tel Aviv. Dermer blames Hamas for a double war crime. They target our civilians by firing rockets indiscriminately into our population center, hoping to kill as many Israelis as possible. But the other thing they do is they embed their terrorist infrastructure in civilian areas. So they place their weapons next to schools, next to mosques, next to hospitals, and they even took over military intelligence of Hamas, took over a building where journalists are because they want to use these people as human shields. Well, these are legitimate military targets, and even though they're legitimate military targets, we will take the steps necessary to keep civilians out of harm's way. Israel has taken out large towers inside Gaza City and large parts of Hamas's war machine, but with relatively few casualties in light of Israel's massive bombing campaign. Because we warn them. We actually call people. We then fire a weapon that sort of knocks at the top of the building, telling people, get out of the building. We give them the time to leave, and then we take out the building. The Associated Press is outraged over Israel destroying the building that housed its offices even though Israel reportedly showed evidence to the U.S. that Hamas worked out of that building. Dermer says Hamas is manipulating the media. Part of Hamas's strategy is to turn the media into enablers for what they're doing. How does it work? They will fire rockets at us. Then when we respond to that rocket fire in those civilian areas and unfortunately make a mistake or there's collateral damage, civilians die, then Hamas wants the entire world to blame Israel. The media should report on everything, on everything but they should lay the blame squarely where it belongs, on Hamas. And if they understand Hamas, that the media will not enable them. Dermer says Hamas's strategy is to confuse the situation. They want to say both sides are at fault. Both sides are not at fault. On one side, you have a democracy called Israel that values human life, the lives of our own citizens, and also the lives of our enemy civilians, those who, who they are using as human shields. On the other side, you have a terror organization that glorifies death that is trying to kill as many Israelis as possible and doesn't care about their own people. They actually will use them in their propaganda wars. And I don't think any moral equivalency should be made between the, uh, between the two. During the current conflict, Dermer says U.S. evangelical support is vital. I hope that Christians will make their voices heard now. I hope that they will call their representatives, tell them how important it is to stand with Israel. Because I can tell you something, Chris, and you've seen this around the world. Those people who are the opponents of Israel they're in the streets. They're waving their flags. They're demonizing Israel. And it's important that the friends of Israel go out there and make clear that they stand with Israel. According to Dermer, what lies ahead is a determined Israeli campaign to degrade Hamas's ability to wage war so that this conflict does not repeat itself anytime soon. Chris Mitchell joins us now for more on the fighting. Chris, listen, in 2005, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon pulled Israeli settlers out and troops out of Gaza. The result has been catastrophic. Don't you think they knew this would happen? Well, Pat, we were there in 2005 when the disengagement happened, and there were people warning. Uh, they were actually saying the people inside, we are the finger in the dike. Don't take us out, because what's going to happen is terror is going to flood in. Uh, just a, a little history lesson. There were 21 Jewish communities there, 9,000 people inside Gaza. They employed many Palestinians. Now, before 2005, there were some mortars inside Gaza. 
But after 2005 and the disengagement, it changed dramatically. Uh, after the disengagement, thousands of rockets near Gaza were like in places like Starot. But beyond that, it just continued. Uh, there were three conflicts, 2008, 9, 2012, 2014, each one greater than the last. The number of rockets increased, the range increased. And so now we're watching instead of what was small terror attacks inside Gaza to these 9,000 people, we're watching uh, Tel Aviv get hit regularly. And right now, Pat, we're watching the largest average rocket barrage in Israel's history, about 460 average a day, many more than the uh, than what we are up, up on the second Lebanon war, Pat. There were 4,034 days today. There's almost 3,000, more than 3,000 in eight days. Many of these rockets supplied by Iran. And right now we have a foothold for Iran on Israel's southern border. So the disengagement, as you said, it's really been a bitter and a tragic lesson for Israelis. From 9,000 back in 2005, now we have 4 million Israelis in and out of bomb shelters on a regular basis. Chris, uh, tell me if I'm wrong on this, but I understand the Biden administration has resumed giving money to the Palestinian Authority, which in turn is controlled by Hamas, and they are in turn buying weapons from Iran, which are being used to bomb Tel Aviv. Now, am I correct in any of those things? Well, I was uh, slightly just uh, adjusted just a bit, Pat. They are giving uh money to the Palestinian Authority, which actually, uh, in many, uh, the, the view of many, is emboldening the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. Uh, what's happening in, uh, in Hamas is actually threatening the rule of Palestinian Authority inside the West Bank. What we're seeing in Iran right now is that uh, Iran is supplying, funding uh, these missiles. They were just last week, there was a Palestinian Islamic Jihad spokesman that was boasting that Iran was supplying these missiles. They're not only supplying these missiles, but they're giving them technology to build these missiles. So now Hamas can man manufacture their own missiles. That's exactly what uh, Israel's trying to do now, is degrade the ability of uh, Hamas to manufacture th these weapons and shoot them indiscriminately into, uh, into Israel. Christy, you think there's any possibility of the IDF going on a, a ground war to, to just clean that uh, Gaza Strip out? Well, Pat, you know, in normal circumstances, you would think that was exactly what uh, Israel should do. For Israel, it's a last resort because they don't want to put all of their uh, soldiers in harm's way. It's probably going to be, uh, they estimate, 100, 200 soldiers. That's what happened in 2014. It's very difficult fighting. It's urban warfare uh, when they go in there. And, uh, and one thing they don't want to do, Pat, is really take over Gaza completely because then they don't know exactly who's going to take over after that. So I think it's a last resort. It's still possible. They do have thousands of reservists on the border right now, tanks, artillery. They're ready to go in if they have to, but I would think, Pat, it would be a last, last resort. Great. Chris, thank you for, again, inspired reporting. Well, in other news, mask or no mask? The CDC has given the green light to drop wearing masks for everyone who's been vaccinated. And so why are some businesses still saying you have to wear a mask? John Jessup has more on that. That is right, Pat. Starbucks is the latest national business to go maskless. The company joining Costco, Walmart, Publix, and Trader Joe's in giving vaccinated customers the go-ahead to drop the mask, so long as state and local governments don't require one. However, other businesses like Home Depot leaving mask restrictions in place for now. Some blame confusion from the CDC. Over the weekend, the director saying the new guidance doesn't mean there should be widespread mask removal until state and local governments work out their policies. Others concerned that there's no way to verify who's been vaccinated. Many businesses are worried because, you know, there's no way to really confirm who indeed is vaccinated and who is following the CDC guidelines as they should be. In Oregon, there's a move to require businesses to confirm vaccinations before allowing customers to go without masks. Nationwide, at least nine states already banning what are being called vaccine passports. Well, the co Colonial Pi uh, Pat, back to you. Well, um, before we leave the mask thing, uh, there's a story out that's so important about this uh, uh, Institute of Virology uh, in Wuhan. And uh, we're trying to determine, and hopefully I can have something on for tomorrow, about how implicit uh, Dr. Fauci was 
uh, in uh, the whole uh, enhancing uh, the uh, coronavirus that has killed millions of people around the world. It's a shocking story, and hopefully we can get more on it for you tomorrow. John? Sure, Pat. Sorry for stepping on you earlier. Well, the Colonial Pipeline is wide open and millions of gallons of gas are flowing to the East Coast again. While shortages are easing, there are still some dry spots, including right here in Washington, the nation's capital, where 80 percent of stations still face shortages over the weekend. One woman stranded for days. So how long have you been stuck here? Um, since Friday night. Friday night. You haven't been able to move your car no. at all. And you haven't been able to get gas for the car. Right. Experts say panic buying contributed to the fuel shortages. Colonial says it could take up to two weeks for some areas to get back to normal. In the meantime, analysts say, Pat, if you don't need gas, try to hold off on topping off those tanks. You know, it's an amazing thing. Uh, the Biden administration has said, well, it looks like the hacker who did that is located in Russia. Russia, not China, Russia. And it was a devastating hack at our infrastructure. But the amazing thing is to think that uh, Putin let somebody in his uh, domain run a hack of that magnitude without his knowledge is just nonsense. We don't think the Russians were implicated. Well, yes, they were. And this is just a warm up. But I have been warning forever and ever and ever about the uh, danger to our infrastructure, not only to the, uh, uh, well, the, the fuel supply, but our total electrical grid is, if there's some kind of a, a corona uh, explosion coming out of the sun, uh, that would devastate us. A low-yield nuclear explosion over Chicago would literally shut down the entire nation. You see what happened with one pipeline. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, you know, guess what Biden did on the first day of office? He shut down the Keystone Pipeline. We've got to have pipelines mm -hmm. and we have to be able to give f fossil fuel. People need gas and they operate. This country is so dependent on it. And there's no way in, in, in anybody's imagination that we will be able to have enough renewables, uh, you know, of wind and solar and all that stuff uh, to accommodate the need of our nation. But I'm telling you, if we don't spend some money to harden our grid and to harden these, uh, you know, they talk about infrastructure. We all want to see infrastructure. But we don't want to call infrastructure uh, teachers' salaries and, and, and child care and things like that. What is infrastructure? I think the Republicans and the Democrats can get together on an honest infrastructure bill. But we are urgently hoping that the alarm has been sent because of this colonial pipeline, that the major infrastructure, the roads and the bridges and the... Uh, uh, electrical grid and these other things have got to be hardened and it needs to be done immediately. It will cost so little now and it will cost such a tragic amount um, if, if our, our nation will be crippled unless somebody does something about it. John. Well, Pat, from the East Coast now to the West Coast, about a thousand residents in Southern California are under evacuation orders today as a brush fire grows rapidly. The Palisades fire nearly doubling to 13,025 acres Sunday, where flames are feeding on dry mountain brush. The Topanga Canyon is about 20 miles west of downtown Los Angeles. California expecting another rough wildfire season. Right now, one third of the state is experiencing drought conditions. One expert, Pat, predicting the western U.S. could see the worst drought in almost two decades. Well, again, we pray for our friends in California. And um, uh, I, I don't know whether you attribute this to bad management or whatever it is, but it, it is a tragedy. All eyes are on the current battle in Israel. But in a few weeks, Israelis will be celebrating the 54th anniversary of one of the biggest military victories of all time, what is known as the Six-Day War. As a tribute to this amazing conquest, 
CBN Films produced a documentary called In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. So why do the Jewish people call their triumph God's victory? Scott Ross interviewed the writer and director of that movie in Jerusalem to find out the answer. By 4.30 a.m., the Israelis had reached the Jordanians' command bunker. For the next 45 minutes, they lined the opening of the bunker with 21 pounds of TNT. This is Ammunition Hill. This is the site of what is still today the bloodiest battle in Arab-Israeli history. I talked with In Our Hands, the Battle for Jerusalem writer and director, CBN's Aaron Zimmerman. The docudrama tells the story of Israel's victory in the city during the 1967 Six-Day War through the eyes of the paratroopers. Did you do reenactments here? We did. The people who run Ammunition Hill were very great to us, and they let us have the run of the place for two and a half nights. We had snipers shooting from the bunkers. We had them crawl through the grass, up the hill, through the barbed wire. They even showed us the original bunker. The battle kind of ended when the Israelis got to the top of the hill, and they found the Jordanian command bunker, and they took 21 pounds of TNT and blew that sucker into next week. And so they showed us that, and they said, well, you're welcome to use this bunker again to stage your explosion. And we thought, great. You know, if it survived a real explosion, it can survive a fake movie one. Based entirely on facts, the film includes dramatizations of important scenes, like Commander Moto Gore talking to troops on the Mount of Olives. We are sitting on a ridge overlooking the old city, and soon we shall enter it. The old city of Jerusalem, which generations have dreamed of and longed for. We will be the first to enter. And running through the streets of Jerusalem under threat of sniper fire to take the Temple Mount and Western Wall. We had done another docudrama, The Hope, about the beginning of Israel. And we thought, what's the next chapter in that story? And we went to 67, and, and it's such a great story. And we thought, well, let's not do a dry documentary. Let's get to know some of the men who actually lived it. And digging into all the background, historical data, et cetera, that must have been an enormous undertaking. I tried to use primary sources as much as I could. I tried to use people's diaries. I tried to use minutes from Israeli government meetings. I used personal interviews. But all of the dialogue in the film was recorded in history. As a result of the war, Israel tripled in size, beating the combined armies of Syria, Egypt, and Jordan to win the Golan Heights, the Sinai Desert, and Judea and Samaria, and reuniting beloved Jerusalem. To cover the whole war would take too much time. So we narrowed it down to the Battle of Jerusalem, and then we narrowed it down further to one group of men, the 55th Paratrooper Brigade. And I really liked them because they weren't regular army. They were the reservists. They were a little bit older. They were the husbands and the fathers and the businessmen. And they were the guys that ended up going into Jerusalem. We shouldn't wait for that to change. Let's go. Step on it, Ben Su. I mean, these actors are very realistic. Oh, they're great, yeah. Did it have an effect on the actors themselves? Because it's more than just history. This is their, in many cases, their fathers, their grandfathers. They're depicting this. How did they respond to that? I had a lot of guys tell me their personal family histories. I had so many guys say to me, well, my grandfather was in the Holocaust, or, or my grandfather, in one case, Sharon Friedman, who played Motegor, his grandfather was one of the guys who fought for Jerusalem in 48 and saw the whole siege and everything. The little woman who came and offered up the flag, she wanted that flag to be used and flown. At the Western Wall. At the Western Wall. I mean, that brought tears to my eyes. Oddly enough, the paratrooper, Yoram Zamosh, who's part of that story, I asked him, did you ever see that family again? And he said, we did. And he said, a few months after the war, the old grandmother had passed away. Really? Like she was waiting. She had lived through getting kicked out of her home in 48, and she had lived through all of that, hoping to see Jerusalem reunited. From start to finish, Zimmerman worked on the film for just a year. But was there anything that you uncovered, something unknown, not something 
that you just didn't know anything about at all. What was interesting to me was the response to the paratroopers when they came into town. They were heroes. These families came out. Now, keep in mind, there was also a blackout because of, of the Jordanian shelling. There was all of that going on, and still these women would come out of their houses with food. How did it affect you personally? From the film side, I learned what an amazing thing can happen when everybody works together and you have so many good people doing what is their specialty, whether it's training the army, whether it's doing makeup, whether it's doing explosives. What I took away from the war, there are two things you can do in life. You can practice and plan and plan and just the hard work and living something to see that result come out the way that it did. Or you can be in a situation like the paratroopers where you train for one thing, then life throws you another way. And can you adapt to that? I asked Zimmerman what she wants the audience to take away from the film. Oh, uh, well, two things. I, I tried hard to keep it as apolitical as possible to give it a wider audience. So number one, I want them to see the sacrifice that these men made. Number two, we went back 20 years to 1948 to what happened when the Jewish quarter fell and the Jordanians ethnically cleansed every Jew from the old city of Jerusalem. And then at the end of this segment, the Jordanian officer says, we have so completely destroyed this place that no Jew can ever return here. So then we fast forward 19 years and show how they did. And what will Israelis think of the film? I hope it will be good. I want people to take away a pride in their heritage. And after all the bloodletting and everything else that's occurred here historically, <laughs> there's no way that Israel Jews are going to give up this city. No, I don't think so. I mean, Moshe Dayan said it when he got to the Western Wall. We've come to the city never to depart from it again. Scott Ross at Ammunition Hill in Jerusalem. You know, I interviewed Yitzhak Rabin, who was the general in charge of the people who took over that time. It was a more marvelous interview, I think. It, uh, it's something that will live in my memory forever. Wendy? Yeah, this is so well acted. I love it. In Our Hands, if you have had the chance to see In Our Hands during its theatrical run, you weren't alone. It was actually one of Fathom Events' biggest box office smashes ever. As many theaters are still closed, we want to send this incredible docudrama right to you for your gift of any dollar amount. We'll, we will send you a DVD copy of In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. You got a little sneak peek of it just now. And not only that, but you'll also get instant streaming access in stunning 4K video. So just go to cbn.com slash in our hands, or you can call us 1-800-700-7000. But I was so impressed. Aaron Zimmerman did She's amazing. Good. A game changer. That's what Heather Lewis calls it. After six months of pain, she was healed in an instant. How did it happen? You're about to find out. Back in August of 2016, uh, we'd had a couple of weeks of rain, which is very unusual for us in Texas here. It was so overgrown, the mower kept dying. And then at one point, when I started it, I had a pain in my finger, didn't think much about it. Later that day, when I was inside, is when the excruciating pain started. This went on for about six months and I finally decided, well, I guess I need to get um, get this looked at <laughs> because I just kept thinking it would heal even though I couldn't use my hand. Menial tasks like carrying a plate, you know, to the table or um, picking up clothes, picking up my purse and it would just shoot this excruciating pain through my finger. And so I went, uh, I had an MRI and they confirmed that the ligament was torn and uh, they sent me to physical therapy and that didn't work, um, so they told me I would need to have surgery. You know, I was a single working mom, worked on a computer all day, and I just couldn't, you know, determine, okay, when's the right time? So November 18th, I was watching The 700 Club, and I loved the show, and the words of knowledge um, I particularly looked forward to. I loved to hear about the healing. What's funny is when I would hear the words of knowledge, I would always hope, oh, wow, that'd be so awesome to, to you know, here's something for me. And all of a sudden, uh, Pat Robertson said, he said, a there's a torn ligament. A torn ligament, a torn ligament. And uh, it's really been sore. And the doctors really haven't been able to do anything for you. Put your hand on that part of your anatomy where that ligament is torn in the name of Jesus. 
I immediately did that. I immediately put my hands around my finger and I was like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the healing. And I started to kind of straighten it, which I mean, I hadn't straightened my finger in, <laughs> I don't even know how long. One of my favorite things to do, which I could not do um, for the past several years, is play basketball with my um, 15 and a half year old son, Logan. I can shoot now. It's been a game changer, literally, in that respect as well. When, when God healed me, it was just, you know, affirmation that he is not a respecter of persons and that he doesn't have any partiality and he just um, he can heal any one of us at any time. He will work everything together for good. Even if you don't see it while it's happening, we may not understand it. We just have to trust that he is with us and he's working everything together for our good. I love it. All wow. you have to do is trust God. Now here's some, after 30 years, Susan Mulberry of Florida Learn to live with chronic nerve pain. Hmm. While watching the 700 Club, she heard Wendy say somebody with excruciating sciatic nerve pain that just won't go away. Today, the Lord's touching the nerve and you are made completely well. By faith, Susan claimed her healing, and Susan, God bless her, hasn't had any pain since, Wendy. Praise the Lord. Here, here's one. For several months, John of Orlando, Florida struggled to breathe, which made him discouraged and scared. While watching the club, he heard you pray for someone, Pat, who you said has congestive heart failure and breathing issues. Pat went on to say, don't think this isn't for you. As John heard Pat describe his symptoms, he knew it was for him. He called the CBN prayer line rejoicing that he is completely healed and his breathing is normal. Hallelujah. <laughs> Folks, we believe in God. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And Jesus said to his disciples, hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive. Why? That your joy might be full. God Almighty wants you happy. He wants you to be filled with joy. Now, we're going to pray for people in this audience right now, and we're going to ask God for you. So I'm asking that you pray with us, and we're going to believe God. Amen. Father, Jesus. I join hands with my sister in Christ, and we declare that you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask and think. And so right now, we ask There's a lady named Marjorie, and you've got lupus, and you said there's no way out, and the doctors have said there's no healing. Marjorie, in the name of Jesus, God's touching you right now. Touch her. Wendy, what do you have? There's, um, there's a person, you, you just saw that story about the lady whose hand was healed after six months, and you're saying, uh, I have something similar, but yours goes all the way up to your shoulder. And it's been very difficult for you to um, to do the everyday tasks as well. And uh, you're saying uh, you want that healing. Well, God is saying He has that for you too, and He is no respecter of persons. So just uh, just if, and I know you're able to do it now. Raise your hands and praise Him because you have just been healed in the name of Jesus. Uh, Michael, you, you're, you're 59 years old, and you've had a diagnosis of liver cancer and you think it's terminal, and you've been just ready to die. Right now, God says, you will live and glorify my name, and God is reaching down and healing that cancer in the name of Jesus. Wendy, what else? There's, um, there's someone you've just been suffering from debilitating depression, and this is new for you. You, you haven't struggled with this before, and you're sort of like, what is this? Well. It, uh, God is delivering you today. Uh, put on praise music, start worshiping, and change the atmosphere in your home, and that's how you're going to get deliverance in Jesus' name. Uh, there's a lady, uh, I believe the name is Norma. You, you have migraines. Just touch your forehead right now, and those migraines will leave you, and you will not have them again. In Jesus' name, touch her. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, for all those in this audience who are crying out to you, May the anointing of the Holy Spirit rest upon them, and may they perceive your glory in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, listen, <laughs> a lot of you who received something just then, and many others have been crying out to the Lord. Now, we've got folks on the phones right now who love you and are waiting for your call. All you have to do is pick up the telephone, call in, somebody's here. It's 1 800, it's a toll free number, 700 7000. 700, and somebody's here who pray. We'd love to have those reports of what God's doing for you. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Many Americans racing to file their federal taxes today. The IRS extended the deadline in response to the pandemic. If you can't file today, you can ask for an extension. Taxpayers in areas declared a disaster by the Federal Emergency Management Agency will receive an automatic extension to June 15th with no penalty. Those areas include Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana, all affected by severe winter weather. Well, CBN continues to influence Hong Kong through our Cantonese language version of the 700 Club. The program received increased positive attention from Hong Kong news media following a testimony featuring a Hong Kong student in the UK infected with COVID-19 who says the Lord miraculously healed him after returning to Hong Kong. Also, a new series of stories produced in Malaysia has added to the program's ministry uh, reach on YouTube. Well, you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. Dalsy earns a living picking through garbage at a dump. She hunts for items that she can recycle. On good days, she earns about $3, but that was before COVID hit. Now she makes next to nothing. Here on a garbage dump site in the Philippines, Dalase spends seven days a week scavenging for items she can recycle. Sometimes I can earn about $3. Other days, only a little more than $2. Dalase is a widow raising her children alone. The family's desperate situation was made even worse when the government enforced social distancing at the site due to COVID-19. Dallas's time collecting items was cut in half, and so was her income. For a while, they had to live on a dollar a day. It was not enough to buy food, so I just found some wild plants and boiled them. Mostly, we just ate a little rice. When Operation Blessing learned about the emergency situation, we sent a team with food packs to help more than 40 families working at the site. The food packs contain staples like bread, canned goods, and rice, along with hygiene kits and hand cleaner. I am happy because we really had no food left, nothing. My children and I are so thankful for the help you gave us. I am grateful to Operation Blessing. Wow, can you imagine having to just go out and pick some kind of wild plant and that's your dinner? I can't. Well, thanks to you, they don't have to do that anymore. Thanks to your generosity and your love for people that you don't even know, but you'll meet one day in heaven. I just want to say thank you because you are making a huge difference and they are so thankful as well. Um, if you're not a partner with us, I'd like to invite you to go to your phones right now and say, yes, I want to become a CBN partner. It's just $20 a month. That's just 65 cents a day to make a difference around the world and right here at home. And when you do that, we want to send you Pat's new teaching. This is our gift to you when you join. It's called God is for us, verses of salvation, peace and victory. It's all from the book of Romans. And Pat, you read this, right? Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, we want you to have it. It's yeah. your, it's our gift to you when you call us right now. 1-800-700-7000. right, we got email. All right, let's go. You've had you've had a break. You've had so you are well rested, praying. Yeah, I'm ready. ready. Right, let's go. <laughs> you are ready. I, this viewer. is the toughest question of all. I've been wrestling with it myself. Go ahead. Okay, well let's go. Here's a viewer. The question is, will you discuss the serious issue of divorce and remarrying? It is my understanding, and to me, God makes this very clear, that we can divorce if we want, but we are not to remarry unless our spouse has died. Your thoughts? You know, this is a tough thing. You know, Moses said, uh, if a man doesn't even please with his wife, he can issue a writ of divorce and put her away. That was in the Old Testament. So Jesus said, in the beginning, that's what, not the way it's supposed to be. In the beginning, God made the male and female, 
And for this cause, a man shall leave his mother and father and be cleave unto his wife, and the twain shall be one flesh. What God has joined together, let not, not man put asunder. And he said, except for the cause of unfaithfulness. And then the apostle Paul said, well, uh, if the unbeliever wants to leave a marriage, then the believer is not bound. That's called the Pauline privilege. So you're asking me, the Bible, you know, in Malachi, the Bible says God hates putting away, hates divorce. God hates it. And yet at the same time, there are irreconcilable differences. And so you ask me this question, uh, what about uh, divorce? Well, divorce is, well, God doesn't like it, but it's permissible. And then if you get married uh, under those circumstances, the Bible talks about it being adultery. Now, I have come up with something that I, I you, you can blame me for it, but I, I think it's true that uh, it would be called the Pauline privilege that if a spouse makes it impossible to leave, to live with them, that the brother or sister should be free. I don't think that marriage should be a bondage where people are in, in slavery to an impossible situation. You remember that scripture that says this, it's better to, to be in the corner of the house than, than in a big house with a quarreling woman. And, uh, you know, I just think, you know, that w with today's world, there's so many divorces. And I think the, the uh, church as such, God gave us the privilege of binding and loosing. That meant we can put regulations on people and we can take regulations off of people. And I think the church as a whole should meet together and deal with this whole matter of divorce and remarriage because it is so prevalent. So the question you ask me is, it's, can you get a divorce? Yes. If you remarry, is it adultery? According to the scripture, yes, unless you have those other exceptions, all right? Amen. Good word. Here's Matthew. Uh, should a Christian be involved in mentoring? Does the Bible say anything about mentorship? Well, uh, you know, there were, there were, uh, Elijah had a, uh, a, a servant who went with him, and they, you know, they, 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 uh, there's nothing wrong with having a pupil or a disciple who follows you. The Apostle Paul had people who went with him and learned about things. There's nothing wrong with that. A mentoring is a good thing. Yeah, I'm mentoring um, a young lady right now from Regent University. Good. Although I think she's actually mentoring me. <laughs> so I'm not sure. How. <laughs> I, I don't know who the mentor is or the mentoree. Sure. Right. We're mentoring each other All for right. sure. <laughs> Vanessa, you know who you are. All right. Daniel uh, says, I am a Christian man who has been following Jesus for the last 30 years, but I don't feel comfortable with our new pastor. He's, he's behaving very strange, especially towards some of the men. He has given them his personal mobile number in case they want to party at his house. I even heard one member of our church say that he tried to kiss him. I cannot accept this behavior, but I don't know how to do to do or to deal with it. Can I contact another church for help? Well, uh, you know what it says, if you see a brother uh, overtaking, go with somebody else to him and deal with him. It looks as if that pastor is a homosexual and uh, that's what you're dealing with. And so you're not comfortable in that environment. You certainly are free to go move to some other church, but the, the, if, if you want to see, can I redeem him? Well, then you go in a spirit of humility and say, brother, here's the way it is, and we'd like to pray with you, and would you apply it? And then if the Bible says, if he won't receive what you say, then treat him like a, an unbeliever. Okay, that's what the Bible says. All right. Good advice. Here's Helen. She says, we've all heard the concept, use it or lose it. Does this also apply to spiritual development? Good question. Well, it absolutely does. I mean, you know, uh, whatever you've got, whatever muscle you, you don't use, and uh, if you don't uh, read the Word, if you don't pray, uh, you get hardened in your heart. So, yes, of course, you, you lose that sensitivity to the Lord unless you exercise whatever you've got, all right? All right, here's Sandy. She says, do Christians need to obey Old Testament law? Well, if you read the Apostle Paul in the words of Jesus as well, Jesus said, you're not under the dietary laws. Paul said, there's only one law, and it's the law of love, and otherwise you're free from the law. 
So we're not under the law. The, the law was for the Jews at that point of time. We're under grace. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Paul wrote to the Galatians and said, who's bewitched you? Did, did you, do you do see miracles of, of, among you from the hearing of faith of the work of the law? Well, you get your miracles through, through faith. Mm -hmm. And we live in a world of faith, and we're in a new generation, a new covenant, not the old covenant. Huh? Should we still read the Old Testament, though, and glean well, I, from I it? I read it because it is so rich, and it, you learn so many things. I learn more from the mistakes of these other people. <laughs> but you read about what happened to David. You read, you, you want to know how does God deal with humanity? And of course, you read in the Old Testament how God deals with humanity. It's rich, and I love it. I love the Old yeah. Testament. I do too. I, I, but yeah, I, I love them both. But you say, are we supposed to be under the law that's written in the Old Testament? And the answer is no. Are we supposed to learn from these principles that are in there? Of course. All right. Amen. 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 Good stuff. Okay. I think your time off has paid yeah. dividends. I, I, I try to learn a few things up in the mountain. <laughs> Darlena was looking to be rescued. Philip, he was fleeing from abuse. And when they got together, their marriage imploded. How were they able to mend it after a blood curdling scream? You're about to find out. My grandfather was an alcoholic and he would start drinking every night around quitting time and inevitably pick a fight with somebody before dinner was over. It, escalated way beyond physical altercations. Frequently, there would be guns brought out in the picture. And there was many times that we were all held at gunpoint. My dad was a very hardworking blue collar guy and he would push and drive himself so hard. And then when he would come home, he would start to drink and get angry. And when he got angry, somebody always got hurt. When Philip and Darlena Fields first met in graduate school, they had no idea how similar their backgrounds were. Because of their unstable childhoods, both Philip and Darlena responded to the gospel when they heard it as young people. When I walked into this little country church for the first time in my life, I felt that safety. You know, there was something present in the atmosphere that wasn't present in my home, love. But then when they said, hey, this is, this is all about this man, Jesus, I was, was hooked. I got saved at an Assembly of God church camp at 17. And that is one time in my life that I was glad that my mom made me do something because I completely gave my heart to Jesus, all my hopes and dreams. And that was what changed the, the trajectory of my life. Philip and Darlena married. They went through premarital counseling, but the baggage from their childhoods quickly surfaced. I was looking for a handsome prince in Wranglers and Boots to come and rescue me. I didn't know what a, you know, what a fantasy that I'd conjured up in my mind. And when you grow up in brokenness and abuse, you fantasize of a rescuer. There was a combination of struggles. A lot of it was family influence. What, what she had was, you know, I'm gonna come at you and fight you. And what I had was, I don't wanna fight you. I hate conflict and I'm gonna run away. I kind of thought that my way was more godly than hers because I, I, I wasn't uh, exploding with anger and attacking. I was really triggered with Philip's disappointment in me. Once the disappointment set in, it triggered depression. The Fields grew their family and their ministry, but still had a lot of work to do on their marriage. Philip says he often escaped through alcohol and binge watching TV. Our real enemy was fear. You know, my, my fear of conflict was my fear of being controlled. Her uh, fear of disconnection was, you know, expressed in anger. And so it's like, hey, don't pull away from me. And I'm like, hey, I got to pull away from you because you're not safe. At one point, Philip experienced a church split. His ministry crashed and he fell into a deep depression. He left Darlena and began living on the streets. That was me testing God. You know, I didn't just go to the streets to help the homeless. 
I wanted to be one because I felt that way inside. I felt like I'd blown it. I felt like I had failed. I felt like that everything in my life uh, was over. Philip came home after a week, but while he was on the streets, he contracted hepatitis. With Philip's health and their marriage in jeopardy, they heard about a deliverance ministry. So the program that we went to practiced corporate deliverance. And so I was in a, we were in a corporate deliverance setting. The person that was teaching touched on self-hatred. And when he said, we tell the spirit of self-hatred to go, something came out of my chest. It's such a force. And I let out this blood curdling scream that I couldn't imitate because it wasn't me. And after that day, my suicidal depression was gone. Philip had an encounter with the love of God that, that healed his soul and eventually healed his body of hepatitis. The Fields continued to seek more counseling and were able to rescue their marriage. Today, they have a ministry to couples that includes the physical and mental aspects of a relationship, as well as the spiritual. We didn't just need communication skills. We needed healing. That healing thing says, I want my heart changed. And that's a Jesus moment, right? And so we bring Jesus into the healing, and then we use the healing as a way to learn how to communicate better. It was when I set my family free from the fantasy that I was, I had them in prison too, is when they were free to be who they were. It, it was like a revival hit our home, you know? When we crushed fantasy, we destroyed the fantasies that we had had for each other, our marriage, our ministry, and went after the real. And that's when we started having the marriage and the family and the ministry that we dreamed of that brought great fulfillment, contentment, and peace. Great fulfillment, peace, and contentment. That's what we all want in our marriage. But they needed healing. They had to bring Jesus into the, the healing. They, were, they weren't just poor communicators. They needed healing. And you know, unless you love yourself, you can't really love anybody else, can you? I mean, here's Darlena. She didn't even know she was afflicted with self-hatred until she went to that deliverance. And then you have Philip who thought he should live on the streets with the homeless. Neither one of them felt worthy of love until Jesus showed them, I'm gonna fix you first, and then I'm gonna fix your marriage. You know, I feel like there's so many watching right now that you're identifying so much with this couple. And there's so many people that deal with self-hatred and you don't even know it. If you grew up in a family uh, where you were criticized continually or an abusive situation, over time, that can develop into a stronghold of self-hatred. And right now, I think we should just get rid of that first. So do me a favor, put your hand on your heart and repeat after me, God, loves me. Jesus died for me. I am precious in his sight. And if you just pray that, you have been set free. And I pray God fills you right now with his amazing love. And I pray he heals marriages all over this land. Pat, back to you. Thanks, Wendy. Our power minute comes from Romans. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Tomorrow, the most famous baker in America. You don't want to miss Jack Phillips' testimony. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.